Across the whole ancient world, people used a broad array of techniques and disciplines to make themselves attentive to what they thought to be hidden information buried in the events unfolding around them. These practices, classified in Greek as the disciplines of Mantic and in Latin as divinatio, were utterly common. They were not, for the most part, considered esoteric or occult. The ancients understood that the universe had certain inclinations built into it, which were more or less closely tied to the inclinations of the gods. Like the weather, these were a part of the ancient atmosphere, and throughout the Greek and Roman sources we find people trying to gauge the prevailing winds. They perceived messages in a wide variety of signs, but nearly all of the most prominent and durable of the Greek and Roman systems make use of animals. Aeschylus's overview of the classical terrain, put into the mouth of Prometheus, announces where humans might look to find these hidden indicators, and he gives animals the balance of attention. And I marked out the many ways of divination, and among dreams I first discerned which are destined to come true, and I explained to them words overheard by chance and chance meetings. The flight of crook-taloned birds I distinguished carefully, which by nature are auspicious, which sinister, and each has a particular mode of life, some are hostile to each other, and they have affections and favorable positionings in groups, and the smoothness of their entrails, and what color the gall must have to please the gods, also the speckled symmetry of the liver lobe, and the thigh bones, wrapped in fat, and by burning the long loin I set mortals on the right path in an art, that is difficult and murky. In the functionally infinite range of potential vocabulary for the divine language, it does not simply stand to reason that animals would emerge as such a prominent category. The grounds for this are doubtless manifold. Since prehistory, people were accustomed to making life-critical decisions based on the behaviors of animals in the food supply, and such attentiveness may have become acculturated in stylized and systematized forms. Such a link is already made by Democritus, Democritus, 5th century BC, who explained divination by entrails as an indication of whether fields will be barren or productive, other possible reasons for the interest in animals can be adduced. It was a part of ancient law that many animals possessed a certain quickness and acuity of perception that made them able to sense things that humans were not yet able to. The non-discursive modes of thought in which divination is understood to engage a line with the instinctive thought processes of non-human animals, where discursivity is non-existent. Ancient observers make such connections explicit. Finally, modes of divination that focus on animals would have provided a means to reconcile two large pieces of human identity that Greeks and Romans typically separated. They configure the world of non-human animals, with which humans' creaturely natures are aligned, to be instrumental to, and not antithetical to, the human intellect, which most ancient observers set apart from our corporeal, animal qualities and align with the divine. Such a focus on animals as a medium to reach the divine accords with a congruent focus in the fundamental religious practice of sacrifice, with which divination is often paired. Most ancient observers classified divination in two main forms, artificial and natural. In the first category, messages are observed in significant phenomena in the world outside the observer, the meaning of which is determined using empirical methods. The observer correlates the present observation with past records, to see whether it bodes well or ill. In this variety, divine signs are regularly found in animal behaviors and the structures of their bodies or parts. The flight paths of birds, the twitching of entrails, odd actions of large mammals, or the feeding behaviors of chickens are all considered significant over time. According to the second kind of divination, the inward, natural variety, a human, being receives a direct inspiration through dreams, visions, or inspired oracular pronouncements, via a distinctive kind of cognitive activity. Even in this variety, centered as it is on subjective human experience, the theme of animals also surfaces. A rich and multivalent tradition of philosophical commentary on divination consistently links it with the creaturely side of the human being. Thinkers often draw connections between divinatory insight and animal instinct. The prominence of women as oracles, Pythias and Sibyls, whom Greek men typically marked as being closer to animal nature, is a noteworthy preliminary indication. One school of thought, the Stoics, achieves a grand unified theory of divine signs via understanding the cosmos as a whole to be a single living animal. Instinctive animal behaviors are signs. Of the animals that are potentially signs in the classical world, birds take pride of place. In an early indication of this, Hesiod sums up the works and days, 
his almanac of how to live, with a final sentence that places bird reading on a paratactic footing with everything else he has talked about. A man is happy and lucky who knows all these things and does his work without offending the deathless gods, who discerns the omens of birds and avoids transgression. The Greek term for bird of prey, oinos, becomes elided with the idea of any kind of divine sign, Europides. My, comes to mean, to read omens generally. Already in Homer's time birds were looked to in the most important of the divination systems. Calchas is equally a mantis, a seer, and the most skilled of the bird interpreters by far, that bird divination is often understood to be distinctively Greek has contributed to an underdeveloped study of its Near Eastern antecedents. But an interest in birds as divine signs is in evidence in Babylonia, Assyria, and among the Hittites, an early 5th century inscription from Ephesus expresses rules for bird divination in the distinctive protasis, apodosis style, if this, then that, characteristic of thousands of Near Eastern divinatory tablets, why the ancients found birds important is impossible to say with certainty. It is often remarked by scholars, but less often by ancient testimony, that their proximity to the sky put them closer to the divine. Their simple capacity to defy gravity would also have been a potential source of raw wonder, as well as their oral richness, made even more poignant by their appearance and disappearance in conjunction with the seasons. The speed and impulsiveness of their actions is also probably a factor. Birds of prey are especially important. Their eating of meat deepens their association with the world of animals, down to the level of the sinews, and this may reflect an ongoing importance of corporeal and visceral natures in divinatory practices. Some have suggested that the choice of this class of birds is associated with divination by entrails. Tix dispersy was not present in Homer, when birds of prey were already favored, rules out a straightforward dependency. But it may still be the case that each of these practices reveals a related, deeper habit of divinatory thought, in which insight emerges from the most rudimentary features of organisms. The following are the most important birds, along with the gods, if any, with which they were traditionally associated, the eagle, Zeus, falcon, Apollo, hawk, raven, crow, owl, Athena, hen, heron, and vulture. While figures such as Calchas and Tiresias are legendary for their acumen, the Greek technique of bird reading never resided exclusively with any formal or informal social or political group. Anyone was authorized to read birds, and the ability to do so correctly correlated more closely with social standing than official position. This sets Greek bird reading in contrast with both prior Near Eastern and later Roman parallel forms, in which the procedure is surrounded by a large bureaucracy. The significant elements are flight path and cries, and, in the poetic tradition especially, a whole range of more exotic happenings, often involving prey, a snake, another bird, even a fawn. The categories of right and left are the most prominent. They can on occasion be lined up with east and west, which would mean a normative northward facing. The evidence does not highlight this, suggesting instead that the most relevant data is not cardinal geography but their position with respect to the observer. Typically, some recently initiated or proposed course of action is thought to be endorsed or rejected by the appearance of a bird omen. Observers look for positive or negative readings along a binary scale, with natural behaviors and the right-hand side aligned with positive signs and unnatural or left-hand orientation taken as negative indicators. The hermeneutic system in bird reading never quite becomes reduced to consistent rules, a heterogeneity it has in common with nearly all other divinatory systems. Among the Romans divination from birds is equally prominent. A summary of the auspices survives in the lexicon of Festus, speaks of five kinds. Of the three most important, two varieties focus on birds. In addition to signs from thunder and lightning, humans were particularly interested in avian flight patterns and cries, in the feeding patterns of specially kept chickens. The remaining two types, auspices taken ex quadrupedibus were seen in the odd behaviors of mammals, on which more in a moment, and those ex diris, scc knees, drew conclusions from odd coincidences and accidents of any kind. As was the case with Greek, the proper Latin term for the observation of birds, auspicium, from avis plus specio, comes to mean observation of divine signs in general. Among the Romans, in contrast to the Greeks, a strong social institution, in the form of a collegium of augurs, grows up around the auspices to regulate and perpetuate the techniques, and deliver authoritative interpretations. 
The duty actually to perform the associated rituals fell to other magistrates. All matters of civic consequence required that the augurs be consulted, holding the office was a mark of high social and political stature. Even Cicero, whose views on divination were extensive, complex, and full of doubts, nevertheless venerated the office as a repository of social capital, and himself held it for a time, ads whose song was significant were known as arsines and those whose flight was were called elites. It is useful to divide divination in a Roman context into two classes, one that officially and formally seeks out omens, impetrative, and a second that reads unsolicited omens, oblative. Oblative category is familiar from the Greek materials, where the typical bird sign arrives spontaneously. The Romans' impetrative versions are strikingly more developed than the Greeks. In official state functions, when considering or commencing any course of action, auspices were taken to determine whether the gods favored it. The person charged to carry out auspices ex avibus would mark out a sacred quadrant of the sky using a wand, lituous, then pitch a tent in a position to observe the heavens. The whole area was then made sacred by a ritual. The seat and the designated region of the sky were known as the templum. After the ceremony began any birds, or lightning, appearing in this screen were understood to be a divine omen. Every military camp established a templum for official use, and the city of Rome itself maintained a permanent one on the top of the Capitoline Hill. The region of the sky was important enough that any building that occluded a part of it could be ordered to be torn down. For auguries taken extra pudious, the Romans observed how a select group of chickens ate their grain. If they ate greedily, such that grain fell from their mouths, it was considered a positive sign. The reading was negative if they refused to come out of their cages, did not eat, made a cry, beat their wings, or flew away. The sound and force of the grain hitting the ground was of particular interest. The ceremonial chickens were kept in cages for the purpose, and were tended by a special expert in such matters known as a Polarius. The Romans understood divine signs as rendering judgment on the timing, not the content, of the action proposed. The ceremony could be repeated to achieve the desired message. Signs were valid for one day only, and the judgment they rendered could be supplanted by another ceremony on the next day. Roman auspices did not indicate the future, only divine approval or disapproval for the proposed course of action. The kinds of bird behavior observed, especially impulsive, darting movements and sounds, are of a piece with a certain brittleness to the procedure, made all the more so under the weight of the heavy systematization that the Roman custom supported. The auspices required strict silence, silentium, and anything that broke it or otherwise disturbed the ceremony was called a defect, vishum, that could render the sign void. These aspects underscore a strong degree of impetuousness to the knowledge retrieved, opening up a further association, at a larger structural level, between divinatory knowledge and animal instinct. There is further interest shown in a range of different animals and their behaviors, which are either signs themselves or are closely connected with divination. In examples of the latter, Apollodorus records a legend that the famous Greek seer Melampus gained his acute power to understand the significance of bird cries from having snakes lick his ears. Camus is made capable of speaking prophetically when two snakes feed him with bees' honey as an infant. Socrates reports a legend that swans sing louder just before their deaths as if prescient of their fates. Snakes and other creatures were noted to be aware of coming weather conditions. Lions between such behaviors and divination are often murky. Among the Romans, strange births of all kinds could be divine signs. Over this class the professional haruspices, the particular expertise. Animals with deformities are important, particularly those with too many limbs or feet. A prominence is given to those that cross species, especially humans with non-humans, as, for example, in the case of women giving birth to other species of animals, to offspring that are mixtures of humans and animals, animals born to a different species, coincidences and strange behaviors involving four-footed animals, ex quadrupedibus, made up another category of auspices for the augurs to consider. Suetonius relates that as Caesar's death approached a herd of horses that he turned to the wild by the rub icon in dedication to the river refused to graze and wept copiously. Cicero relates many comparable anecdotes in his De Divination, as when, for example, a general and his horse accidentally fall, or mice are observed to have eaten through shields for battle, or a mule, a creature sterile by nature, gives birth, or a monkey goes berserk and upsets a lot-drawing ceremony. Structure of animal parts as signs. Entrails. 
Observers in classical antiquity also saw divine signs in the movements, color, size, shape, and texture of the internal organs of the animals they sacrificed to the gods. Divination from entrails is not disconnected from divination from birds. That birds of prey are favored as sign givers already highlights the connection with animal meat, and Greek tragedians make the link with extinction.